Hello everybody! So, today's video is music theory and continuing our track. We did sections 1 through 7 uh, last week, and so today we're going to go 8 to 14. So, let's get started. 8.1. Oh, actually, no, just 8. Key signatures. Key signatures are the alterations which are placed at the beginning of a piece of music between the clef sign and the time signature, and which affect the pitches indicated for the entire piece of music. That is, a sharp placed on the F line or a flat placed on the B line will affect all the notes of this pitch throughout the piece without further indication. The derivation of these signatures and their specific uses will be discussed in detail in a later chapter on scales. If you want a little um, a teaser as far as key signatures go, how to write them out, I have a previous video where I um, wrote out all of the uh, key signatures. I'll make sure that I link it in this video. So that's all I'm going to say about key signatures for right now. Moving on to dynamics. Dynamics. Dynamic markings show the performer the degree of relative loudness or softness at which a piece is to be played. The words commonly used are listed below with their abbreviations and meanings. Notice a lot of uh, Italian here. So we have pianissimo, pianissimo. This is PP at very soft, very soft. I don't, let's see if I can. The velocity on this thing is kind of wonky. I'm using a M Audio Oxygen Pro, and I mean, it, it's it's a fine little MIDI controller, but it can be a little bit tricky to get that touch just right. See? So that's about a pianissimo, and then piano. Let's see if I can. It's a, little, it, it's a little bit tricky trying to keep that weight right, so let's see. Almost there. And then mezzo piano is medium soft. Uh, that's MP if it's, in, if it's in music. Mezzo forte is medium loud. Forte is loud. And then fortissimo. Now fortissimo I can do really well. There we go. And then forte. That's about a forte. Fortesimo is pretty much pull out all stops if you were doing organ and just let her rip. All right, so that's that is our dynamic markings, and there are there are other shades of that. So sometimes you will say forte tissimo, so three fortes. Um, I think you'll see that in a, a lot of the romantic music, such as. Uh, Berlioz has some I know, Mahler has some, uh, so it, it is present. You'll also see, I think, in some of Prokofiev's work as well. So anyway, moving on, and, and it says here, there are other terms which refer to shadings or nuances in, in music. These all indicate some sudden or progressive change in the level of volume. Forte piano, this is FP, loud and then suddenly soft. So, so that would be... Um, that would have to be for some instrument that has an attack. You can't really do that with a keyboard instrument per se. But like, if, uh, let's see if I can sing it. So it's, oh, so, do, do. So you just pull it back in, and then piano forte is the opposite. Bom, bom. And just it goes out, and then sforzando is kind of like a it's it's kind of like a forte piano, but it's reinforce an explosion. So off to back up, you look, pum, oh, pum, so, dong, and then just so it, as, as you see, reinforce an explosion. Crescendo is to gradually get louder. So that if I were to, if I were to um, see if I can increase the hold on this instrument here. We go here, da, 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 there's the hold, and then I'll, uh, the crescendo, I would have to do it manually. So let me see if I can, need to reset, let me go ahead and set to a controller here. Uh, dum, bum, good, there we go. All right, so, okay, there we go. So now I'm gonna see if I can do this, ready? 
So that's if I, I think I'm on the right one, yeah. So I need to hold out the sustain and the decay. Attack is good. Make sure I don't drive, drive the volume, but well, here we go. So you noticed. So there we go. So that, that would be an example of um, a crescendo. I'm having to do it manually, but uh, you get the idea. You could do it with a, a stringed instrument, um, a, a reed instrument, um, uh, uh, brass, uh, the human voice. So with that, let's go ahead and um, make sure I got my volume set back where I need it. There we go. Huh. Sounds like a clicker now. Turn down my release. There we go. see what's there we go i was just playing around with the settings in in l mms i'll i'll link the uh the uh it's a it's a digital audio workstation a daw i made some videos on it previously but it's it's a it's an excellent little piece of software if you want to play around with sounds and just learning how to work with various aspects of sound so pardon the technical difficulties so let's get back to our music notation so we have forte piano forte a piano forte sforzando crescendo diminuendo or decrescendo this is to gradually uh to make gradually softer so if i have my volume up here i pull it away that would be a decrescendo uh, let's see, morendo, dying away, softer. So this is if I were to play and it just slowly begins to fade away. So let's see if I can start my volume here. It just sort of fades away. So let's see if I can start a little higher. just fades out fades out so that's morendo and then perpendosi dying away softer so it's pretty much the same as morendo and then smorzando dying away softer so you see that three words for the same thing so so obviously that must be a pretty important idea of just being able to produce music where you can then just sort of fade away fade away into the next into the next uh, part of the program or who knows what but anyway morendo perpendosi and smorzando so those are all uh, versions of a, decre of a decrescendo moving on to tempo at the beginning of a composition we often find certain words which tell us the approximate rate of speed at which the piece is to be performed. These words are usually placed above the first measure and above the time and key signature. They indicate, only in a general sort of way, the speed of the basic background rhythm. For exact indication of speed, we rely upon the metronome, the most commonly used indication of tempo um, uh, follow. So, larghissimo, or... Uh, yeah, lar larghissimo. This is broad and stately. Largo, largamente, larghetto. Uh, all of those mean the same thing, broad and stately. And then we have grave, is heavy and dragging. Lento, slow. Ar adagissimo, adagio, adagietto, adantino. All of those mean the same thing, slow. So a slow rate of speed. And they have some... Uh, like a range on the on the metronome if you see a metronome in fact let me see if I can pull one up here this is an example of 20 BPM and is that this is 4 4 time 20 beats per minute so very slow 2 3 Four, one, two. <laughs> wow, that is so slow. Wow. And then, what's our next one up? Uh, solene or grave. If this is slow and solemn, so this is twenty to forty BPM. So let's go ahead and take a look at what forty BPM is like.
So this is 40 BPM. Two, three, four. So solene or grave, lento is 40 to 60. So let's take a look at 60. And notice these are ranges, so it's not exact numbers. 60 BPM, four, one, two, three, four. Hopefully that's not too loud for you folks. And then lentissimo is 48 BPM or slower at a very slow tempo, lentissimo. So 48 BPM, we were to do that. Oh, 48. So lentissimo. Largo is once again, it's like lento, 40 to 60 BPM. And then larghetto is 60 to 66. So a little bit of a tighter range. And let's go ahead and take a look at that. So that's 60. So that was our 60. So 48. Uh, this would be anywhere within Largo, correct? 56. Yep. Still Largo. Larghetto. Um, adagio. Well, that's a little too loud for you folks. Sorry. There we go. There we go. So... 80 would be tranquilo, and then uh, andante moretto, a bit slower than andante. This is 92 to 98. This isn't very, a very fine tuner, but uh, it'll be 72, 80, 87, 95. So this would be roughly andante moderetto, moderetto. 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. One, two, three, four. And then what's our next one? So then we have mod moderate tempo markings. This is our 72 to 128 rhythms. So let's see here. So taking a look at, let's see, andante. So once again, andante at walking pace, moderately slow. So that's right at andante. Good. A little bit faster. 80 would be Andantino, slightly faster and more lighthearted than Andante. There you go. And then Moretto is 108 to 120. So that's about Moretto. And if I'm, if I'm pronouncing it uh, incorrectly, let me know in the comments. And then Allegretto is 100 to 128. Ooh, come on, slow down. There we go. That's about it. Allegretto. There we go. Dun, dun, din, dun, bum, ba, din, bum, 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 ba, da. All right. And what's our next one? Fast tempo markings. So this is where we get, this is where it gets crazy. All right. So, allegretto is moderately quick, almost allegro. And so this is about the same. So you see that um, almost allegro, so pretty much the same speed. So this is the slower side of the fast markings. And then allegro starts at 120 and goes up to 156. So this is about the slow end of allegro. And then we move up to 156. There we go. Good. Still a little too loud. There we go. And then uh, Vivace it starts at 156 and goes to 176. So that's Vivace. And then Vivacissimo. And this is just a little bit very fast and lively, faster than Vivace. So this is about 10 or about 4 beats. Starts at 172 and goes to 176. Oh, that's a little too fast. Okay, there. There we go. So that's vivacissimo. And then allegrissimo or allegro vivace. Very fast. And this is 172 to 176. So essentially the same for vivacissimo and allegrissimo. The same BPM markings. Presto starts at 168 and goes up to 200. So if I were to then drag this up to 1 to 200... 
So they're right there. That's Presto. Oh, lost my marking. There we go. So that's Presto and then Prestissimo. This is anything above 200. And how fast can we go? It's too fast. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Alright, so there's our there's our rhythms. That took quite enough time, I believe. So let's go ahead and stop that. Boy, I'm going to have to cut that one down in the video. <laughs> Alright, so going back here, and that was it on the website. So let's go back to our notes. Let's go back to our notes, our PDF viewer. So what, what did we cover? We covered... Uh, let's see... Let's go ahead and hide the metronome as well. Don't need that. All right, so what did we cover? We covered larghissimo, largo, largamente, larghetto, grave, glento, slow, adagissimo, adagio, adagietto, andantino, andante, moroletto, allegretto, allegro, vivace, presto, and prestissimo. And these are the rough English translations of the Italian. Broad and stately for the first four. Heavy dragging for grave. Lento is slow for all. For lento, adagissimo, adagio, adagietto, and andantino. And then andante is moving, going along moderately slow. And then moderato, moderato, I'm guessing. Moderately, moving along, uh, going along moderately. Allegro is brisk and lively, vivace is fast, presto is rapid, and prestissimo, prestissimo is rapid or quick. The general pace may be modified by other words which imply an acceleration, a slackening of speed, a suspension, or return to the original tempo. The principal words are, for speeding up the tempo, it is accelerando, gradually accelerating, stringendo, uh, suddenly accelerating, usually with a crescendo, and piumoso, a sudden, a steady rate of speed faster than preceding movement. For slowing up the tempo, um, rallentando, gradually growing slower, ritardando, uh, same thing, uh, ritenuto, a sudden drop to a slower rate of speed, menomoso, same thing, and then calando, same thing, a sudden drop to a slower rate of speed. Morendo, growing slower and softer. And smorzando, same thing. Return to the original tempo is a tempo. And then primo tempo, back to the first tempo. And stesso, or lo stesso, or li stesso, the same tempo as before, usually after a change of time signature. There are certain words which may be used along with the general tempo indication which give a more definite idea of the character of the piece. The principal words uh, used for this are amabile, I'm guessing, amiable, affectuoso, affectionate, they give uh, the character, amoroso, uh, very affectionate, lovingly, Ag agitato, agitated, appassionato, uh, passionately, uh, br brillante. Boy, well, I'm really showing my ignorance with this one. Br brillante. I can't speak. Brilliant. Con brio. With brilliancy. Cantabile. As if sung. Con anima. With animation. Con fuoco. Fuoco. With fire. Con spirito. With wit or spirit. Capricioso. Con bravura. Uh, con delectivo. Delectesa with de with delicacy, con gracia or gracioso with grace, graceful, con teneras uh, con teneresa with tenderness, delicato uh, delicately, dolce softly, doloroso with deep sorrow, uh, dramatico dramatically, ener energico. <laughs> Energetically, expressivo, con expressione, uh, expressive with expression, giocoso, uh, gay or jolly, innocente, uh, innocent, la lagrimoso, as with tears, maestoso, uh, masterly, majestic, furioso, furious with fury, and nobile, nobling. Oh, there's more. Uh, pesante, heavily, pomposo. Pompous, religioso, religiously, resoluto, resolutely, rustico, rustic, semplice, 
simple with simplicity, sostenuto, sustained, tranqui tranquilo, uh, calm, tranquil, tristamente, sad with sadness, vivace, lively or quick. Sometimes a general tempo, there we go. I hope you got your laughs out. Uh, sometimes a general tempo may be modified by one of the following adverbs. Poco, uh, a little. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, ritardando poco a poco, slower, little by little. So, poco animato, a little faster. Poco più, a little more. Molto più, much more. Non tanto, not so much. Non troppo, not too much. So uh, an example would be allegro, non troppo, lively, but not too fast. And then assai is quite, quasi, such as, meno, less, poco meno, a little less, sempre, always, still, molto, uh, much, more, or quite. Besides these commonly used words for indicating tempi, these, oh, so you see, tempi is the plural of tempo. There are other words applied to the uh, accentuation or articulation of a particular passage. These will be listed here. So we have legato, smoothly or sustained, connected. So you see this would be a slur over the, o over the text. So, oh, I need to turn my volume up a little, don't I? There we go. There we go. A little too loud still, huh? Let me see what that's like in... There we go. So that would be legato, and then tenuto, very sustained, hold for full value. And then non legato, semi staccato, half sustained. Or, so if I can play. So that's non-legato and then staccato. Separately detached short. So legato, tenuto, non-legato, and staccato. Musical abbreviations. There are certain conventional signs and words in music used as abbreviations in order to simply, uh, to simpli to simply music writing. They mean simplify, to simplify music writing. To indicate that a certain section of music just performed is to be repeated, we place two dots before the double bar like this. Okay? So if you have those, if you see those two dots in your music, you know that you are to repeat um, a particular passage. If the end of this section is to be played differently on the repetition, we indicate this by two endings. So if I were to play this the first time around, one, two, three, one, two, three. Let me turn it down a little. Bum. So you see, I repeat. And then I went on to the second ending. So you notice if if you could read the music, then I played the first ending, went back to the beginning of the section, and then once I got to the section here where it goes to the D, on the second ending, I went on to C. So um, that is for the repetitions. If you have your, um, if you have multiple sections that you have to repeat. Now moving on, we have da capo. Uh, it literally means from the head. So you would play, uh, you would play from the head. So you'd play from the beginning of the music. And then dal seno means from the sign. So there would be a sign in the music that you would go from the repeat to that sign again, and then uh, and then repeat for the second time round. Fine. Fine means to repeat to the end. It, um, usually you would then just go on to the end. In, in making a da capo, the performer returns to the beginning of the piece or movement and repeats the same until Fine. So whatever is marked as fine, that's where you go to. In making a dal seno, the uh, or dal, dal seno, the uh, performer returns to this sign and plays to the fine. The sign, uh, this circle with a cross through it, sometimes accompanied by the words al coda, means that the performer, when playing through a de capo or del or dal seno, uh, for the second time, should go from the sign. To that position in the music in the piece or movement marked coda. 
Okay. If there are any repeated strains, when the player goes back to the beginning to play through the work again, these repeats are generally ignored. Simile means similar and that the same phrasing, etc. is to be continued. The following signs, an abbreviation of the words octavo, octava alta, and octava bassa, mean that the part written is to be performed an octave higher or lower. So it's written, imagine, imagine, let's see if I can drop my, uh, there we go. I'll have to increase it. Okay, so it's written on the, it's written on the staff on the treble clef as if it were to be those notes right there, but you play them the octave up. Oh, that's too loud. So it's written on the staff as this, but because it has octava alta, you increase it up an octave. And then the same, so in bass clef, if it's written there, that would be B A G B. And I need to drop my octave modulate down. There we go, up one. Good. Increase my volume a little bit. Good. So instead of playing these notes here, it's down the octave. So you just play it. So that's octava bassa, octava alta, octava bassa. Okay. A V A, eight V A. Loco cancels the octava and the passage is played as actually written. So if I have my treble clef here, I need to in modulate. So I, I, I play this section, uh, the first portion at octava alta. And then I drop, I, and I play what is actually written. That's still too loud. There we go. See? So I take my octava alta section. And then immediately loco means I then... I play at location, loco. Okay. So that is octava alta and loco. Uh, below are the symbols used for other repetitions in music. So if I have, if I have these notes here, uh, you see here on the left hand portion, these are repeating. So this is a So if it is a half note with a double slash through it, then it's playing at the 16th note. It's rather difficult to see that. Uh, maybe, I'll, can I zoom in at all? Ooh. I just lose connection. There we go. Nope. It's too too bad of a, of a, uh, of a, um, of a picture. But if I were to play it, it would be... And if I have my metronome on... See here, bum, bum. let's get a good metronome marking here. Let's do 87, that should be good. So this is 80 BPM. So that would be the first sign, and then the second sign would be... Oh. And then the last one is... One and two and one and two and one two t four one two three four one two t four one two t four. And notice I'm I'm saying t. That's a uh, that's a a trick I actually learned in uh, in in uh, choir that um, if you're trying to speak a line, you don't say three because three is harder to say than t. So one two t four one two t four one two t four. So our very first one. One two T four, 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 and then our second one, one, one and two, one and two and, and then our last one, dun dun, ba ba, dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, dun dun. All right, so those are the re those are the repeats, and then our second one. Let me go ahead and turn that metronome off. We don't need that anymore. Let's stop. There we go. So our guys can still see that right good so then our second 
Our second portion would be, uh, let's see, repeat. So if you see a line and then you see the symbol, it's a Z, it looks like written right after, then that is going to be uh, repeat the preceding measure. Uh, so. so I played those two measures on the lower portion just below the repeats and so you just take whatever the previous measure was and you repeat it. And then we have on the right hand panel here, we have um, a marking, uh, it's a, a, um, a bar that has a number written above it. What that means is that for whatever that number is, that's the number of rests. You see this a lot in, uh, in, percussion, um, in, in percussion scores. Um, it's actually kind of a meme for them. But you see here that if you have this this top portion here, the equivalent line is below it. So that's four bars of rest Four, I should say four measures of rest. OK, and then below it, we have uh, if we have our uh, notes here, C, A, E, and then if you have the symbol to the right, so it actually looks like if I'm not mistaken, those two symbols on the left hand and the right hand side, what what I assumed to be a Z here on the left hand side, it is actually it appears to be two bars, two diagonal strokes, and then two dots. And what that means is you repeat, you repeat whatever pattern is encompassed by that dashed line. So you see it has two, it um the the symbol encompasses two measures, and so it means take your previous two measures and you repeat them. So, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two. Pretty simple. Okay. Moving on. Ooh. Oh, I think I, 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 I think I have this in another, another document. Let me pull that up here. I'm back now. Uh, and this is the octave chart. I just have to get it in place here. And where is it? There we go. So we have our base, our, our octave levels, and this is subcontra, subcontra octave, and that is, oh man, that is the octave below the C. I don't think they have the numbers here, do they? Oh yeah, they do. C, C1, C2, C3, and C4. So uh, middle C is C1, and then C it could be C0 or C a small small octave, great octave, uh, contra octave, and subcontra. So on the, let's see if I can play it here. Just make it out, I think. So that probably, that would be contra, I believe. That's contra octave. So subcontra is the octave below that. <laughs> oh man, and I don't think they show the hertz, the hertz in here. But that's yeah, that's that's pretty low. Okay, and then contra octave. So that's contra octave. So subcontra is that low C. Okay, and then great octave. Nope, that's small octave. So this is actually great octave. And then great octave. And then we have small octave. Um, that was small octave, then one line octave. I think. <laughs> Let's see what the numbers are on, let's see what LMMS is telling us. That they say that this is C5, which I believe that is middle C. Yep, and that's too loud. There we go. Okay. That's the one line octave. And then two line octave is up one more. Woohoo. That's way too loud.
What is up with that? Let's see here. Is it the low pass filter maybe? There we go. Yep, that's that's a little better. Uh, is there something on still? Because it sounds like it's buzzing. But... Okay, so that would be our... What octave was that? That would be our three-line octave. And then our four-line octave. Okay, let's see here. So we did our sub-contra. This is triple C... D, E, F, G, A, B, seldom used, contra octave, great octave, small octave, one line octave, a two line octave, three line octave, and four line octave. Now, the, um, the, this might be an older methodology for naming these because currently we use just numbers. So we have C0. Um, in fact, I don't, yeah, you probably can't see it on the LMMS, but if I enlarge my keys here, just, oh, undo there we go open it up just a little bit so you can see this you see these numbers here these are referring to the uh the current octave that it's on so it's not even showing so that's c4 c3 c2 and i might have i might have to actually move my line through here so you see we can go all the way down to c0 so that's C2. C1, you can barely hear it. Hear that? You can actually hear the beats. It's so slow. <laughs> and then up an octave. So that's C1. And you remember uh, previous video, we, um, we had the Hertz, the Hertz line. In fact, in that list, uh, the the frequencies you can actually hear the frequency now at the slowers at these lower t uh, these lower frequencies hear the beats and so then c2 so that's c2 c3 all right and i just moved it up one more so i'm gonna so we did c3 now we'll take a look at c4 c5 and c6 C4, C5, C6, and then it goes up to C7. I don't know what my upper range is on this thing. I think I can go C7 and C8. So, oh, man, that'll, that'll set your ears ringing, won't it? All right, so there are the names of the octaves. I don't know if these are still used, but there you go. So you have subcontra octave, contra octave, great octave, small octave, one line octave, two line octave, three line octave, and four line octave. Okay, so moving on to our next section, we then have names of musical instruments and voices. In order to talk about music intelligently, the student must learn the correct names, keys, and classification of the instruments commonly used in bands and orchestras in this country today, and uh, used, used worldwide as well. There will be some regional differences, but these instruments are usually classified like this. Stringed instruments, wind, wind instruments, woodwind and brass, uh, uh, percussion instruments, and keyboard instruments. The stringed instruments in common use are violin, with the music written in the treble clef, Shout out to Two Set Violin here. A viola, the viola gang, with the music written in the alto clef. Okay. Uh, and then violin cello, or just cello, with music written for the low register in the bass clef, for the medium register in the tenor clef, for the high register in the treble clef. So it actually encompasses all three. In former times, it was customary for composers to write the cello part an octave higher than it was to sound when writing for this instrument in the treble clef. Today, this practice has been discontinued and the actual pitch is written and the actual pitch is written regardless of the clef employed. Then we have contrabass. This is sounding an octave lower than written and using the bass clef. So if you see a note written here as middle C, it's actually played the note below. So let me make sure that I am 
in the correct let's see here there we go and then I'll, so you can see that note here on lmms uh, there we go so this so it would be written as middle c um, i think that's still up too high there's middle c so if it were written Oh, and you guys, of course, you can't see this. Ah, oh, dummy. All right. PDF viewer. There we go. Yep. Back at it. I think. Is that correct? PDF. There we go. And this needs to be ocular. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. There we go. So we have contrabass uh, sounding an octave lower than written. And all right. So uh, what parts do I need to go back over? Uh, names of musical instruments and voices. In order to talk about music intelligently, the student must learn the correct names, keys, and the classification of the instruments commonly used in bands and orchestras in this country today. These instruments are usually classified like this. Um, A. Stringed instruments. B. Wind instruments. Uh, this includes woodwind and brass. Uh, C. Percussion instruments. And D. Keyboard instruments. Uh, the stringed instruments in common use are violin with music written in the treble clef, viola with music written in the alto clef. So this is a uh, insert your two set violin and viola gang jokes here. Violin, uh, violin cello with music written for the low register in the bass clef, for the medium register in the tenor clef, for the high register in the treble clef. In former times, it was customary for composers to write the cello part an octave higher than was to sound with writing for this instrument in the treble clef. Today, this practice has been discontinued, and the actual pitch is written regardless of the a clef employed. Contrabass, double bass, sounding an octave lower than written, and using the bass clef. So this is where on in LMMS, if I were to play that, so that's the note as written, and it's played down here. Okay. In addition to these instruments mentioned above, there are various other stringed instruments such as the guitar, lute, cymbola, which are used occasionally in orchestral works. So this would also include the Russian instruments, so let's see, the mandolin, uh, the um, balaika, I believe is how it's pronounced. But um, the, yeah, the, so there are there are many stringed instruments out there. Oh, uh, the uh, the uh, Erhu, I believe is what it's called, the um, Asian two-stringed instrument, um, and many, many others. All of these strings and, uh, stringed instruments, with the exception of the double bass mentioned above, are non-transposing instruments. That is, they sound the actual pitch of the note written for them. The wind, the wind instruments in use today contain several transposing instruments. That is, the sound produced on these instruments do not uh, the sounds produced on these instruments do not correspond with the written note. For these transposing instruments, the natural scale is written in C major, but the actual sounds form the scale of the name of the instrument. For instance, the C major scale of a B-flat trumpet actually sounds the major scale of a B-flat. The C major scale of an E-flat saxophone contains the E-flat major scale, etc., we will explain transposition more thoroughly in a later chapter, but for now it is important for the student to learn the key as well as the name of each of these instruments. The non-transposing woodwind instruments which play from the treble clef are flute in C, piccolo in C, and oboe. So these play as written. The non-transposing woodwind instruments which play from the bass clef are bassoon and contrabassoon. And contrabassoon is like a contrabass sounding an octave lower than written. The non-transposing brass instruments which play from the treble clef are trumpet or cornet in C. The non-transposing uh, uh, brass instruments which play from the bass clef are trombone in B flat, bass trombone in F, baritone or uniphone or euphon euphonium in B flat, tuba in F, E flat, or B, B flat. So this would be, what What was that, two octaves below that um, chart that we had last. The transposing woodwind instruments which play from the treble clef are flute in D flat, piccolo in D flat, alto or bass flute in G, English horn in F, clarinet in E-flat, B-flat, or A, alto clarinet in E-flat, 
bass clarinet in B flat, alto saxophone in E flat, tenor saxophone in B flat, baritone saxophone in E flat, and bass saxophone in B flat. There are no transposing woodwind instruments which play from the bass clef. The transposing brass instruments which play from the treble clef are trumpet or cornet in B flat or A, flugelhorn in B flat or A, alto horn or mellophone in F or E flat, and French horn in F or E flat. The transposing brass instruments which play from the bass clef, French horn in F. Because of its extreme range, it is sometimes necessary to write the lower notes of the French horn in the bass clef. Usually, all instruments which play from the bass clef are written for, uh, are written for as if they were non-transposing instruments, but the French horn is an exception to this rule. In former times, F horn parts were written in the bass clef so that they sounded a fourth higher than, than written. So the old way, and this probably isn't even in use at all, is that if you had a note written, so this could be either C or um, either your treble clef or your um, bass clef, so we'll take treble. So that's... And it would actually sound... So it would actually sound there. And then down the octave, it would be... There we go. I believe that's right. Oh, no, down one more. And it would sound uh, the fourth above that. So it would be essentially A, if you were in bass clef. So today, composers write for the, French, uh, for the French horn in the bass clef so that it sounds a fifth lower than written, just as it does in the treble clef. So a fifth lower than written, just as it does in the treble clef. So if you have it written as, um, here, we'll go take the treble or the, uh, the bass. So if it were written this way, it's actually sounding a fifth lower than that. So for, th oh boy, um, I'm gonna have to drop down an octave and then it would be here. So it sound a fifth below what's written. So it sounds here even though it's written. So it's written on the right hand side and it's played on, it's, it's written on the left hand side and played on the right hand side. There we go. The following percussion instruments are of indefinite pitch. Snare drum, bass drum, cymbals, and triangle, gong, tam-tam, uh, castanets, uh, maracas, and claves. In addition to the above instruments, the percussion player is sometimes required to play uh, its various special effect instruments, such as the rattle, wind machine, anvil, etc. The following percussion instruments are played with... Uh, uh, sticks or mallets, they produce musical sounds of definite pitch. This includes timpani, kettle drums, um, bells, chimes, glockenspiel, xylophone, marimba, and vibraphone. So these have a definite pitch. Music for keyboard instruments is generally written above upon two staves and uses both the treble and the bass clef. The most important of these instruments are piano, pianoforte, organ, celesta, harpsichord, clavichord. And today, uh, in, in, uh, in the modern era, we also have the synthesizer. So, of course, this book was written before electronic instruments came on the scene, but that definitely has changed a lot. So um, a major keyboard instrument today is the synthesizer as well. The harp is actually a stringed instrument, but the music for it generally resembles that of keyboard instruments in that it uses a pair of staves. What now? All percussion and keyboard instruments are non-transposing, with the exception of the celesta, which sounds an octave higher than written. The student need not concern himself with unusual or obsolete instruments, such as the sax horn, oboe de amour, um, basset, ho basset horn, basset horn, dolcimer, etc. A more thorough study of all these instruments will be undertaken in a course in instrumentation, which will be later. Uh, or if you're interested, just um, go to... 
after you're done watching this video, pull up a video of and find out what a sax horn, an oboe de mor, a basset horn, or a dulcimer is. Dulcimer. Now we're getting into voices. Men's voices are usually divided according to their registers into these groups. Basses, low voices with the music written in the bass clef. Baritone, medium voices with music written in the bass clef. Uh, and tenor, high voices with music written in the treble clef, but sounding an octave lower. So tenors, uh, they're a transposing voice, I guess, right? Um, women's and children's voices are divided like this. Contralto, or alto, is low voices. Mezzo-soprano, medium voices, soprano, high voices. The music for all women's and children's voices is written in the treble clef. Our final section, melodic embellishments. In the 16th and 17th centuries, when the principal keyboard instruments were the harpsichord, clavichord, and spinet, composers decorated uh, the melodies for these instruments with various ornaments and unessential embellishments. This was done because these instruments had very little sustaining power. The, this, these elaborations made it possible to reiterate certain notes, thereby giving an illusion of sustained tone. Today, authorities differ as to the interpretation of the principal embellishments which are still used. These include grace notes. These are indicated by sm uh, small notes with a line through the stems and are usually played quite short and just before the principal note. These are sometimes called acciatora. Acciatora? I'm just guessing? <laughs> Italians, please correct me. So... It's written as the bum body bum body. So play it up the octave. Let's see what our keyboard's on. Make sure we're good. Let me scroll it over here. And it's in the it's in the good. That should be the correct. So so bum. Um, so it's you you play the note and then bum beam it's like a, a little lift small notes through a line so these the, these are the grace notes oh too loud can you hear that in so let me turn up your volume just a little bit there we go That should work. Uh, maybe just up a little bit more for you. Okay. So the, those are your grace notes. And then appoggiatura. This is also indicated by a small note, but without the line through the stem. It is usually played quite long and stands in place of the principal note, i.e. on the accented part of the beat. So if you have the appoggiatura... And then... So that's your appoggiatura. So let's do that again. And hopefully the volume is not too. Make sure that it's. Oh, you guys can't see that. There we go. Appoggiatura. So let's go ahead and play that. There we go. So you see how it lands on the it lands on the downbeat. So apply this five blade. Bum ba di dum. Okay, so that's your appoggiatura. Slides. These are ascending or descending diatonic series of two or more small notes and are played before the accented beat. So how does that sound? So if the downbeat is one, two, one, two, and then one. So you see little slides. These are ascending or descending diatonic series. So. And then down here, that would be. Oh, A. A. 
So it just falls, it, it essentially falls onto the beat. What is our mordants? Mordants, these are single, double, or triple alternation of a principal note with its upper or lower auxiliary. So those are mordants. They're sometimes also indicated by these pairs. Okay, so uh, there's our mordants. Uh, gruppetti or turns. A gruppetto uh, uses both the upper and the lower auxiliary of the principal notes. So auxiliary are the notes just above and below. So if so, if you have the gr gruppetto or turn. There. And then the one below it, notice we have the sharp. That means that the auxiliary note has been sharped. So there's our grippetto. Trills are made by the rapid alternation of a principal note with its upper auxiliary. So that's a trill. There's our trill. If the trill is to be written on the upper note, it should precede the principal note as a grace note. There we go. So there is our trills. If the trill is to be made on the lower auxiliary, it should be indicated by a small note following the principal note. So if Occasionally, for expressive purposes, a performer will not perform the trill in a perfectly even manner, but will execute it something like this. So, uh, gradually getting faster. My fingers aren't fast enough, but... So, gradually subdividing the beat. The trill is quite often followed by a turn or a grippetto. So... So, ba, 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 ba. and that's so that's a trill followed by a, a grippetto. So that is the that is the remainder of our music notation. So what have we covered? Let's whoa, let's go all the way up and let's see what we covered. Sections eight through fourteen. So there we go. So we covered key signatures, dynamic indications, tempo indications, musical abbreviations, names of octaves, names of musical instruments and voices, and melodic embellishments. So with that, we've, we conclude chapter one notation. So next week, we cover scales, major, minor, and chromatic scales, and the circle of fifths, which will be a review of the video that uh, I have posted previously. So thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.